Grace and peace to you from the one who is and was and is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before God's throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. What a week. One week ago today, we were together, gathered together in this place and in our online space, celebrating the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. We had a record crowd in worship. At the Easter vigil, seven folks were baptized into God's family. Sunday morning, children picked up hundreds of Easter eggs. The church was adorned with fresh lilies and still is adorned, but they're wanting to go home badly today. And the air hung with just a little more incense than we usually allow for the sake of allergies. And we read from this same chapter in the Gospel of John last week, the first 19 verses Last, uh, last week were the first 19 verses, and now today, the next 12. I think there's a misprint in your bulletin. I'm not 100% sure. Last Sunday, Megan Reed was with us here, too. Megan's been a friend of mine for the better part of the last decade. I, I met her during my internship in seminary. I served in her home church of St. Mark's in San Marcos. We bonded over a love for music and our uh, parallel, somewhat parallel spiritual journeys out of the evangelical churches of our respective childhoods and into the Episcopal Church. Most recently, Megan was about to finish up her degree in counseling at the Seminary of the Southwest in Austin. Her graduation party plans were already set. Megan's mom is a member here at Grace. She was confirmed as an Episcopalian and as a, a Grace congregant. What do we call Grace congregants? Gracers? Grace folks? Gracious souls? Maybe we need a contest to decide. Whatever it's called, Stephanie is one of us. and She knows we love her. Megan is actually the one who made sure Stephanie found grace and settled into community with us. It's because of Megan's friendship with me going back that she knew our community would be endeavoring to be a safe place and caring for someone finding her way into a new kind of church community, into a new tradition. She urged Stephanie to come, and I think her first time with us, Stephanie's first time with us was one of our interfaith celebrations on the labyrinth. So I often got to hug and visit with Megan during holiday breaks, and our, our reunions were always full of joy. I said yesterday at her service that Megan's hugs were a wholehearted embrace, and they really were. We don't know exactly what happened, but about halfway back to Austin on Monday evening, Megan's car went off the highway 71 somewhere around LaGrange. It traveled for a while through the blue bonnets in the median of the highway and then rolled over and crashed. Megan was pronounced dead at the scene. So I received a text from Stephanie right as the vestry meeting was wrapping up on Monday evening. And it's been a whirlwind of care and crying and remembering and planning since then. And we did have Megan's service yesterday in her home church of St. Mark's in San Marcos. I know some of you were able to join us online and Astrid was there in person. Megan's untimely death isn't even close to everything that's been going on these last few days. This week I have visited or talked or prayed with many in pain, in, with bad news, struggling in crisis, and others I haven't visited, but I know you're struggling too, in body, heart, or mind. 
So as we pick back up in the Gospel of John, on the very same day as last week's reading, the first day of the week, I'm somewhat comforted to know that even those very first witnesses on that very first day of resurrection are already facing their own fears and more importantly, their own doubts about it all. First, though, I want to share with you a conviction that I hold. You may feel differently, but as the preacher, I take a little privilege in lifting up my own particular slant for us to consider here. And, and so this is it. I don't think God needs us to believe in order for God to exist. I don't think God needs us to believe in order for God to exist. In fact, for me, that's almost the definition of a real God, a force in the universe that goes on being whether or not any other being in that same universe understands it or worships it or even acknowledges it. We might call other lesser things God, but any God that needs something or someone else into, in order to exist is, is a God too small for me. These words we receive from John the Revelator today, words from the prologue of his letter to the seven churches, they really encapsulate this for us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and was and is coming, the Almighty. See, I believe in, in God as a, a non-competitive being. A non-competitive being. This is the term theologian Catherine Tanner has for it. What she means by it is that it's, God is not a, a thing among things. God is not a, a being among beings. Not just another force or person, maybe a little stronger or wiser, playing in our existential sandbox with us. A non-competitive being. God's not competing with us for time or space or anything else. A God who is and was and is coming. An alpha and, o and an omega. A before and after. A God by whom and in whom and, for whom and from whom and for whom are all things, to paraphrase St. Paul. And if this is true about God, and I believe it is, then nothing I do or experience, nothing I face or fear, or any of us face or fear, nothing we endure or even enjoy happens outside of God. It makes the truth of the incarnation even more powerful, uh, this idea that God who didn't have to enters into the world with what God has made, with all of creation, walks the road of suffering, and death, and leads us to the other side, to the life after death, after life. So all that we are, and all that we have, and all that we know, and don't know, is nested in God. He's got the whole world in his hand. The psalmist sings to make this point, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heights, you are there. If I go to the depths, you are there. That's how I've come to believe this little piece of so much of what I don't yet grasp or even think I grasp. One of the appreciations for the Episcopal Church tradition that Megan and I shared um, is for the order, the forms, the rituals of the church that, that help us live into faith in an expanse of God. In my own spiritual journey, God had become way too small. The God we worshipped looked and acted and believed too much like we did. I needed a God who was bigger who challenged me, who, who loved me with an otherworldly, unconditional love, who made stuff and wasn't made by stuff. 
And I remember about, about 18 years ago now, almost exactly, the first thing that appealed to me in the Episcopal church tradition I encountered was the order, which might strike some of you as a little odd because if you've spent much time with me, you know my brain is always working. <laughs> my mind is always going and I'm always taking on too much at once. And, and sometimes I'm trying to draw y'all into too much at once. And my emotions are up and down multiple times per day. I was so drawn to a God who was steady and reliable and faithful, regardless of my own experience, my own exhaustion or elation or my own existential crisis at any given moment. So I'm here with you nested in God and nestled in among the rich rhythms of our life together, the rituals of our tradition, the, the order of our church. And encouraging one another during all the seasons and experiences and struggles and triumphs of life. Encouraging one another. Having faith except when we have doubt instead like Thomas. When we look in on Thomas and the other disciples this morning, we, we don't see much in the way of traditions having formed yet. It is, after all, the very first day since they discovered an empty tomb. Mary Magdalene had found that tomb empty and then, and then encountered the risen Christ and then went and told some of the other disciples what she had discovered. And even though we don't see the traditions and the forms and the order coming into being yet, what we do see already is a community. Disciples have gathered together in that room with the door locked, pretty much having one another and not much of anything or anyone else. And then we read, Jesus appears to them in that locked room, and they are amazed and filled with awe, and they believe that Jesus was resurrected like he said he would be resurrected. They're the first witnesses to the resurrection, and one of the first people to whom they witness is Thomas. They tell him of their own experience with the risen Christ an encouragement to their friend who missed that epiphany. And Thomas, who was not with them to see and believe, says he has to see it for himself in order to believe. In this story, I think Thomas speaks for all of us to one degree or another because none of us get to see. <laughs> that time has come and gone. And so Thomas speaks up, whether it's what you think or not, or what you feel or not, the very fact that Thomas acknowledges not having seen means that he speaks for us. None of us get to see, like the disciples saw. And what I've always loved about this story is that Jesus meets Thomas right where he is. Thomas says he must see for himself, and so Jesus presents him to Thomas so Thomas can see for himself. He doesn't say, oh, if you need to see or believe, you must not be one of us. He doesn't chastise him or scold him. Folks often see Jesus' words to Thomas as a rebuke, but I can't do it because Jesus lets Thomas touch him. And remember one other thing, no one else in that room believed without seeing. They just got to see first. Then they believed, and then they told someone else. But Jesus offers you and me a blessing. He blesses all of us who would come after, including us gathered here today, who would not be able to see, and yet would come to have faith in the God of resurrection, in Christ's Son. In, in God's Son, Christ. The writer of John says that all of this was written down. Why? To help us come to believe. 
And friends, we are only seven days into the great 50 days of Easter. And yet it feels to many of us as though Easter never happened or didn't stick. And if that's you, no one here can do anything to change your circumstances or end your suffering. We would if we could. And I know you'd end mine if you could. But what we can do is what those disciples did for Thomas in that locked room. We can testify to one another of the light we have seen and the life we have experienced. We can encourage one another. We can support one another. We can walk together and trust that all of this, all of us, are nested in God. Amen.